Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19. The Bible says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And verses 20 says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? And he says, Has not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world? Has not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world? The Bible says in verses 21, For after, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, and it pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to serve them that believe. To serve them that believe. If we have to go back from the 19th verse, you see God committing himself to destroy the wisdom of the wise and to bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. But to the end, it is in his wisdom that the world will not know God in its wisdom. That then he will choose the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel to serve them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. It's obvious. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, if we are to understand what God is up to, why is he saying that I will destroy the wisdom of the wise? Of this world in fact in the 20th verse if we are to read in the message version he says so where can you find someone truly wise truly educated truly intelligent in this day and age and the Bible says hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense what is God trying to tell us that the wisdom of this world is brought to nothing the intelligence of this world is brought to nothing. If then you say, oh, the most educated, we get to points where even the most educated people in the world do not know what to do. And I'm not saying that they don't do their best, but there are things that happen that go beyond the most educated, that go beyond the most intelligent, that go beyond the wisest that you know in the world. And one of them is happening right now in this hour. Scientists are doing whatever they can do, and I know they're doing their best. But some of them have given in and accepted that there are things they are not able to do. Every day in this world, we're losing people. A disease, even the most intelligent, have failed to figure. Even the wisest have failed to figure. Even the most educated have failed to figure. And that's what he's trying to tell us here. That if we think that we count in intelligence, this has been exposed to, that the highest level of intelligence has failed to fix this. If we're talking of the wisest, they will try to do what they can. And thank God that they are doing what they can. But we're still losing people. We're still losing people. Why? Because even in the most intelligent, even in the wisest, even in the most educated, there's still something higher. There's still something above. And this is what God is trying to tell us here. That to the most intelligent and the wise and educated, some think there's no need for God. This will be sorted out in our own intelligence. This will be sorted out in our own wisdom. This will be sorted out in our own understanding. 
But what if we have things in life that intelligence can't fix? That wisdom cannot fix? That the best education in the world cannot fix? Is God against education? No. I believe in education. There are doors you cannot open without education. There are things you cannot do without an education. Are we against intelligence? No, there are things you cannot do without intelligence. Are we against wisdom? No, there are things we cannot do, or there are places you cannot go, or there are things you cannot achieve without wisdom, worldly wisdom. But we're only trying to say that even worldly wisdom has an end. Worldly education has an end. Worldly intelligence has an end. And above that is a God that is bigger than all this intellect, all this wisdom, all this education. So we're not against this. No, we're not against it. But we're trying to say that sometimes we go so much into what our wisdom tells us, what our intelligence tells us, what our education background tells us, that many a time we lose the vision of what God is saying in every period and hour. And that's not just happened now. Human history has proved that always. But the answer was, ease and glories be in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, when we are getting into this conversation in Corinthians, Paul is trying to bring an expression of places we get to before, and I've seen it many times in the lives of many people over the years where sometimes our humanly wisdom, our human intellect, intelligence sometimes goes ahead of many things and God is the master of keeping silent when we think that we are intelligent enough to fix certain things. God has a way sometimes of holding peace and being so silent when we think that in our own wisdom without him we can fix certain things. Church history has taught that over the years. Over the years. Human history has taught us that over the years. And for some people, it's not necessarily that it's disease, but there are people who pray and seek the face of God and they don't hear him. He's silent. And some ask themselves questions like, God, I have prayed and believed and sought your opinion about this for so many years. Why is it that you have failed to answer me concerning this affair? Well, there are various reasons why sometimes God does not answer men. But one of the reasons that I know that God does not answer men is because sometimes men have a way of, in the process of seeking answers from him, applying their own wisdom, their own intelligence, their own understanding in a matter. And every time we try to apply our own wisdom, our own understanding, our own way of doing things, sometimes we short circuit the voice of God that is meant to direct, that is meant to instruct, that is meant to instill whatever has to be instilled in our spirits for the next journey, for the next level, for the next place, for the next success, for the next liberties of the spirit. And sometimes we do it even without knowing because we have been raised in a more humanistic society that so much looks to the answers of men more than the answers of their own creator and God. And that's not going to end today. That is why the gospel is foolishness to certain people. It's foolishness to tell men that Jesus heals any disease. But because they think it's foolishness, it does not mean that the word of God is void of its power or that God's ability becomes an ability by men's opinions. No, he still abides God. But men think or assume that, well, there are things that God is not able to do. And so they have invented witty inventions after their own wisdom and abilities and craftiness. But even those things to the end have failed to satisfy, have failed to give solution, have failed to give answer to the fullest, to the fullest. Some of those solutions 
temporarily give answers or some can only give answers to a few but they don't give answers to the whole of human race it is what was it is what is and will always be human wisdom will never be enough human intelligence will never be enough human education will never be enough is that point when a doctor walks into the room and looks at a patient in their eyes and they tell him you know what there is nothing that we can do for you in medicine in modern medicine there is nothing we can do for you what does that family do what does that sick man or woman do and then some at that particular point that's when they remember to turn to god and say oh i think i need god some remember that particular hour but when you are a believer you don't need to wait to get to that level to know that the wisdom of this world is brought to nothing that the intelligence of this world is brought to nothing men have a limitation humanity will always have a limitation because it has a creator and god will always have answers beyond the wisest the most intelligent there is but for me my biggest fear as a believer is the times when men have applied their own wisdom believers have applied their own wisdom have applied their own intelligence on the matter and then the voice of god goes out and shuts from their ears and they never hear god anymore and many of them do not understand that the silences of god many times many many times impress on us to ask ourselves instead of why aren't you doing this sometimes you have to go to why aren't i getting an answer from a god who must speak openly and clearly to me concerning an issue and some of us don't know and the people have been praying for 10 20 15 years 30 years of something that to god it's not even the thing that they're asking per se but it's these other things that they're missing out on and so when we get to the place of drawing board and reconciling these things many of us realize that even though we are seeking the mind the opinion of god we are still applying ourselves to our own wisdom and intellect the bible says trust in the lord with all your heart and with all your mind and he says and lean not on your own understanding part of trusting god is not leaning on your own understanding your individual understanding worldly wisdom worldly intellect and he says and in all your ways acknowledge him and the bible says and he shall direct your path if you are somebody who probably is seeking for direction in an issue in a matter and you don't find direction yet maybe just maybe you have applied your own understanding in this direction before you've applied your own wisdom in this direction before you've applied your own intelligence and human ways of thinking in this way and when you do that that short circuits the power of god the voice of god toward you for instruction the Bible says that his voice is sent for men that they might live. You know, if you don't hear the voice of God, you die. You die. You might not die physically, but something in you can die. The life of a Christian is supposed to have a forward continuous experience of hearing God every time when you need to hear him because he's your father. You're his child. He glories in communicating with you. Even man at his most fallen nature should hear God. When Cain had killed Abel, he still communicated with God directly. When Adam and Eve had eaten the forbidden fruit and fallen, they still communicated to God directly. The voice of God is supposed to be present. But I believe that we are in the hour where many people are asking themselves what happened to the voice of God that we have read in the old testament read in the new testament where is that voice now what about miracles some people say oh how come today miracles do not happen like we read them in the book of acts in some ministries in some people's lives they don't see those miracles say so why don't we see miracles 
signs and wonders like we read in the book of Acts? Why don't we see power and glory like we read in the book of Acts? In the book of Acts was a very, very scaring time because there was a way God used to work. So they say, Ananias and Sapphira, they play with money and they are smitten dead by a man's tongue. Men were smitten blind instantly by men's tongues. Crippled men on temples were raised to life and walking straight. In the book of Acts. Some people say, oh, so why is it that we don't see those things in our time? Because I have to be true that there are people who don't see those things and people who actually no longer believe that miracles exist, that signs exist, that wonders exist, that God still speaks because there are many people who are making God speak. And later it's proved that it's not God who spoke. And so some people are asking, what happened to those days? Well, God is still moving. God is still speaking to his prophets. He's men of God, he's holy ones. God is still working. The healing power of God is still available. It's just that it's not in white circulation as it was in the earlier churches or in the earlier church because of the indifference that we see in the body of Christ today. And in this hour, I come to give an answer. I come to give an answer. Because until we embrace such things, many things are going to provoke us as believers. This disease moving and being talked about has provoked the church because they are asking physicians, healers in the gospel, men who have healing anointings, what are they doing about it? But there are also men who have the grace to heal the sick, but they're not going to be given the opportunity because the world no longer believes in divine healing. But you and I do. You and I do. But I want to talk about those instances when God goes into the silences because of how or what we have applied ourselves to understand in our own wisdom, in our own understanding, in our own intellect and walking away from the purpose and pattern of his word. And because of that, they are silences by God. In history, church history, biblical history, there is a time theologians call the silent time of God in human history. Well, there were several, but there's one major one, which usually is defined from the time of Malachi to the time of John the Baptist. As all of you know, from the last pen of that wonderful prophet, Malachi, all through to John the Baptist, nothing that happened in the history of mankind was relevant, was important enough for God to keep record for, for our learning and comfort for this dispensation. If there were miracles that happened, we don't know about them. If there are signs and wonders that were as remarkable as they ought to have been, enough to be noted, then there is none we know that was noted, meaning that ideally from about the end of Malachi's pen to the time of John the Baptist all into the New Testament dispensation of the coming of Christ his death and resurrection before that which is a span of more than 400 years about 400 years and slightly more God seemed quiet that mean that there were no prophets there were prophets but their positioning was so hidden we have an example when Jesus Christ comes and is born and a prophet called Simeon comes through and says, Oh, God had told me that I was not going to die until I see the salvation of Israel. And then he holds Jesus Christ in the hands and blesses him and prophesies on his life. But there was no provision for such a prophet as a voice in those 460 to 500 years. It was a quiet spell of period. Where there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, there were teachers, there was a synagogue, there was a mode of worship, there was a mode of prayer, there was conviction of a God that existed and was for the Jew. Lo and behold, Israel was under bondage to Roman rule. And somehow even the spiritual leaders of that hour were under Roman rule. 
That is why when Jesus later comes to tell them, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So like, when have we ever been in bondage? We are the sons and daughters of Abraham, we're the children of faith. When have we ever been in bondage? Yet they were under Roman rule. Israel had even lost the identity of being a sovereign people of God. So it's not new. In history, there have been moments where God sort of holds back and lets men become wise and intelligent in their own way and abilities. The Bible says, for all the ways of a man seem rightful. It's very easy for a man to be right in the hour. But it's another thing for a man to be true in the hour. It's another thing for God to speak very clearly. There was a time back in history as well of one of those silences where the word of God was scarce. And the Bible says, and there was no open vision in the days of Samuel. But the Bible says, but Samuel the boy had God at Shiloh. In a time when the voice of God was scarce, vision and revelation was not there, he got one fellow called Samuel and started speaking to him. But there was a priest in that time. There was an order of worship in that time. But God sometimes has ways of getting silent. Getting silent. Getting silent. And many times when human beings go their way of wisdom, go their way of understanding, go their way of interpretation, go their way of intelligence, God has a way of going silent. And so even in this you know, biblical timeline, we see about 460 years of God being quiet from Malachi. It's as though they never existed prophets, but there were prophets. It's as though there never existed priests, but there were priests. But God was not speaking. And because of that, nothing was worth recording in church history. Nothing. There's nothing worth recording. It's possible to live a whole lifetime and die in a generation and one day get to open eternal books and realize that the generation you were in had nothing significant for heaven to record. That's a painful experience. This goes beyond, I'm this, I'm that, I'm a Baptist, I'm this. No, 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 no. First put aside your religious understanding and affiliations. And let's get to the definition here, identity, Christ. Christ. For some people, it's an easy thing. But for some of us, it's a very painful thing to live in a dispensation and nothing is written. Nothing is worth recording. Nothing is worth remembering for the generation that should come after that there was a God in that day. There are people out there who do not know the price of Jesus Christ and why he came. There are believers out there who have not yet awakened to the responsibility and the crowd of witnesses that are watching us right now in this hour. There are people out there, believers, who are not yet conscious of how possible it is to revive your generation and how also it is possible for your generation to pass without anything notable in the total or grand scheme of things. Even in those 460 years or so, between Malachi and the coming of Jesus, there were notable people. There were notable men of God. There were popular men of God. But when God zooms out that timeline, to take us to this hour where we're at, we can judge and say that there was nothing, even in their most notable nature and state, that was relevant enough to keep for the hour, to establish, to teach, to inspire, to comfort the generations that should come after, which you and I now live in. And God forbid that we should live in this time and leave this world one day because we will. And get to that day and the timelines of human history are zoomed out. And our generation is nowhere in record. And our names are nowhere in record. 
that we are alive for something bigger. Because not the first time God has zoomed out and rubbed out certain generations of any effect or kept silent in certain dispensations. And a lot is happening. What people see outside is disease. What we see as the body of Christ is opportunity to prove to the world that God is what he says and who he says he is. But you see, like I said, intelligence, human intelligence, human wisdom, human understanding, sometimes it gets so convoluted and starts to choke God's intention and purpose because the gospel is foolish for the fallen world. Interestingly, from the time of the end of the painting of Malachi, all through, like I said, 400 years through to the coming of Jesus Christ, I went back to study to find out what exactly was happening in the world in that time when God did not speak anything to anyone in those 400 or 460 years, anything relevant for it to be kept sacred for a generation of you and I to learn and comfort the next generation, even be written in the Bible for us to remember. So I went through and searched and searched. Okay, there was nothing written, but what really happened in there? Because my question was, if I can find what really happened in that period, maybe, just maybe, I can connect the dots of why God was silent those 400 years and more. And I was amazed at what I found. And I realized that there is one specific time period and event that falls from the beginning of that time into the time God goes silent from humankind. And I realized that that was what we call the golden age of Greece. The golden age of Greece. Read about it. It happened about 400 years before the coming of Christ, interestingly. And some people call it the age of Pericles. Pericles was a notable statesman in Athens, Greece, a popular fellow. And that golden age of Greece, that period of the golden age of Greece from about 500 BC all through into about 300 BC. You see, it's about 100 years into the last 400 years of the coming of Christ. And again, that's the period God is silent to the church. He's not speaking. The prophets are there, but they're not attuned to the purpose of the hour. The teachers are there, I believe. The priests are there, but they're not attuned. There is no voice coming out necessary to impact the next generations. And interestingly, that's the very period we have men which come up with philosophies. The most ardent philosophers of the hour are within the golden age of Greece. Aristotle is an example. Aristotle starts his craft in the same period of the golden age of Greece. In fact, it was called the Greek miracle. They used to call it the Greek miracle because philosophy during that time was like a miracle. It was the greatest thing that had ever happened to humankind. But what is philosophy? <laughs> humans' greatest ideas. Humans' greatest ideas and notions touching life. Those are philosophies. And then later you see that that's the period. And then you see later that the philosophers that then later come through, like Pluto, those were students of Aristotle. Alexander the Great, those were students of Aristotle. They all come out of this great philosopher. Xenophon, Aristophanes, and the rest of them, they all come through this one fellow called Aristotle. And interestingly, that was the age that invented art in all its forms of art, literature in all its forms of literature, philosophy in all its forms of philosophy. And interestingly, the ideas that are formed in that period, that golden period, are actually the very notions that shape Western civilization. Think about it. They are the notions 
that shape Western civilization. And so if these are the ideas that shape Western civilization, it should tell you that there is no way we can talk about Western civilization. And these ideas, these old things, don't come back in the roots connected to this. Connected to this. And as interesting as it was, I went through to read and research more on the golden age of Greece. To read what happened in those 100 or so years, 100 to 200 years, that period. What happened? 500 BC, 400 BC, 300 BC. What happened in that period? And I was amazed that that was a time when human intelligence was celebrated most. Human meats were celebrated most. Human wisdom now became God. God started to become an idea that was formed by the wisest. And as they became wiser and wiser, they invented different things and different things, and some of which were productive and useful, and some of which were to their own denigration and destruction. Because that's what happens to humankind. They build things that sometimes destroy, even them who build it. And so in that period when I start to see how literature shapes up, how the drama shapes up, how the philosophies, the arts shape up, how all these things start to come into the foundations of how we lead and run you know, our communities and life, I said to see that that's a period that drew away mostly from the voice and instruction of God to the ideas, the wisdom and intelligence of men. And like it was, it had to get to the end of all it could ever get to. And before we knew that, then divisions, dissensions, misunderstanding, mistrusts and wars started to erupt. Because as men continue applying their own wisdom, their own intelligences, their own understanding without the application of the idea of God and truth, many a time, many of them start getting lost in two personal aspirations. Selfish interests giving into things that only interpret their values and then ignoring the values of the rest. The Greek call that hubris. The point when a man gets so confident in what they have and what they can do in their own abilities that they think they're so wise that nobody can add on them, nobody can help them, nobody can advise them because they're the best at what they think they are. And that kind of pride usually leads to a fall. And before we know that, things started to go off. And as interesting as can be, in the golden age of Greece, it is written in history that that was the time suicide was celebrated most and started becoming a philosophy that men started to justify. Because what happens when men apply themselves to their own wisdoms, their own abilities, their own intellects and intelligences and their level of education only without, you know, the moral compass of truth, many of them get to the end of frustrations. Many of them get to the end of depressions. Because there is nothing in this world that truly can satisfy. It's not there. The writer in Ecclesiastes called it all vanity. They seek to apply their own wisdom and they end up in vanity. They seek to apply their own intelligences and their own ideas and then they end up in nothingness. And because of that frustration, in the golden age of Greece it is written in history that that was a time even suicide was celebrated. Suicide, the idea, was elevated as a philosophy in those times to help men escape a time where the more men apply their own wisdom, their own knowledge, their own intelligence, they started to become more wicked, more evil, that the societies they were living in became rotten and evil in themselves and people started hating to leave. In fact, there's a writer of that period was called Farrar. Farrar wrote of that period, the golden age of Greece, and he said, in that time, that period is marked with characteristics of despairing sadness, which became specially prominent in its most sincere adherence. And its favorite theme was the glorification of suicide, which wiser moralists had severely reprobated, but which many 
had praised as the one sin refuge against the oppression and outrage that had happened in the lives of men because every time men apply their own wisdom and intelligence they start wasting and destroying society and the suicide philosophy Farrell goes on to write which was indeed able to lacerate the heart with righteous indignation against the crimes and follies of mankind but which vainly strove to resist and which scarcely even hoped to stem the ever swelling tide of vice and misery for wretchedness it had no pity on vice it looked with impotence disdain even for those which had every advantage of rank and wealth nothing was possible but a life of crushing sorrow ended by a death of complete despair men became more desperate men fell in more stress and destruction than ever before because they had walked away from the instruction and truth of God and applied themselves in human wisdom intelligence human ideas and their philosophies no wonder later on in the times of Paul when he comes in in the book of Acts 17 verses 22. Even though later Christ had come, the effects had spilled on all over even into the time of Christ and after. And then he says somewhere in verses 22, the Bible says, And Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye of Athens, he's talking to Athenians, okay? He says, I perceive that in all these things, he says, ye are too superstitious. And he says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, and he might declare unto you. They got to a point where they became so superstitious that they built every kind of God, coming in every kind of idea, carrying every kind of opinion, carrying every kind of mind on a thing, every kind of witty invention, and putting it there as a form of worship, because that was the only way they could cope with the craziness that was happening in the world, because they had walked away from God. So the creator of heaven and earth became an unknown God and they had still erected a pillar for him. And that's the generation of relativism. Truth is relative. Your God is different from my God, but I believe that all ways lead to God. <laughs> no. That's human wisdom trying to speak. There is no name under the earth by which men are saved, the Bible says. But it is the name of Jesus. He says, I am the way. He says, I am the truth. And he says, I am the life. And he says, and nobody goes to the Father except by me. So somebody will ask me also, how are you sure? The truth is the right one. I also think mine is, I think my prophet is, I think my this is, I think my, my this is. Well, even in the realm of facts that prove and qualify the person of Jesus Christ in truth, if you decide to search, you'll find. He that seeketh, the Bible says, shall find. And so that's why Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, if you read the Amplified Version, he says, as you have therefore received Christ, now he's talking to us believers, as you have therefore received Christ, even Jesus the Lord, he says, so walk, Amplified Version says, regulate your lives and conduct yourselves, the Bible says, in union with and conformity to him. Act and regulate your lives as one which is one with Christ and conformed to Christ. I have a problem when we men of God try to preach a message that disconnects the Christian from Christ. We and Christ are one. He says, I pray that they might be one. They in me and I in you. That we might be one. And may the world know that you have loved them. You see that? You see that? So he says, regulate your lives and conduct yourselves in union with this conformity to him. And he continues to say, have your roots, the roots of your being, firmly and deeply planted in him, fixed and founded in him, being continually built up in him, becoming increasingly more confirmed and established in the faith, just as you were taught and abounding and overflowing in it with thanksgiving. In verses 8 he says, See to it that no one carries you off as spoil again his warning, or makes you yourselves captive by his so-called philosophy and intellectualism and vain deceit, idle fancies and plain nonsense following human traditions 
men's ideas of the material rather than the spiritual world. Just crude notions following the rudimentary and elemental teachings of the universe and disregarding the teachings of Christ the Messiah. Sadly, we have Christians who are so given into intellectualism, philosophies, vain deceits, ideas about the world that are not touching the person of Jesus Christ and what his message and the word applies. No wonder God is silent to some of us, some believers. Because how will he reconcile to show you this when you see that? How? Your mind is double. But he also gives us the warning and says, Take heed that no man lead you off or spoil you. Spoil you. Spoil you. I know believers who can go with every wind of doctrine, who can be tossed by every wind of doctrine, every kind of idea that comes out even without weighing it against the word to ensure that what they're hearing is actually biblical truth. They just go with it. Why? Because the majority of the Christendom, many people don't read their own Bibles. Their Bibles are read for them and they don't go out in the Berean understanding to search out these things whether they be so. And so sometimes it disturbs to see that even when certain things are obvious in scriptures, some people don't see that. Some people don't see that. I love how Paul says of our father Abraham. He says in Hebrews 11 verses 8, he says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive as an inheritance. The Bible says he obeyed and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, the Bible says he sojourned in the land of the promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. The Bible says, For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker was God. There's something Abraham was trying to look for. There's a picture, there's a vision that he had about how the dispensation in which God is should look like. The Bible says he was with the patriarchs moving place to place and these lived in tents. They never erected very stable buildings. Why? Because they were looking for a city whose founder and builder was God. They were trying to look for an atmosphere that was so alive with the voice of God, with the instruction of God, with the presence of God, with the mind of God, with the revelation of God, with the glory of God that would slap any idea, any human understanding or intellect whatsoever relayed in any time or any period of space. And that is the thing that was in the spirit of our father, Abraham, the man of faith. What did he see? What did he see? What did he see? He imagined that the only way we can rest is if we find a dispensation full of God. Not a dispensation we assume has God but doesn't have God. Full of God. I've seen Christians who are so quick in criticizing, oh this one, oh this one, they're so quick in criticizing but they don't have any effect in the spirit. No effect in the spirit. No effect in the spirit. Someone questions, oh, oh, how do you say that this gets healed? That the person telling you has seen a crippled man walking out of a wheelchair. He has seen HIV leaving a man's body. How can he doubt God? Oh, but the fellow who hasn't seen that is the one debating, doubting the wonder working part of God. And the folly of being proud in ignorance. That's painful. But it happens. It happens. What am I trying to say here? I don't know where whoever is watching me is at in life. And where they are at. But my honest prayer for you is that something will catch you tonight in this broadcast. That will cause you to seek the face of God. For a part, no divine zooming, 
in the grand scheme of things can rub out. But may God impress a mark on your life in your dispensation and in this hour through you that will echo through eternity. But such marks cannot be drawn when we still ascribe to our own wisdom, our own intelligence, our own educations. Education is not bad. But education is not God. God is above all of these things. Science is not bad, but God is above science. Biology is good, but God is above biology. And so in this hour more than ever before, much as a lot is happening out there, people are dying, economies are failing, men are getting unemployed, people are going to sell their own stuff, some are sleeping hungry. God is asking the church, what answer do you have? To draw a mark in your dispensation that when this came you were relevant those are the things the church is supposed to be seeking after those are the things the church is supposed to be seeking after I want you to open your mouth right now this very hour open your mouth and start to speak to God Shike brozolo pakatalapa. Come on, talk to God. Brozatalaba kaja katalapa yereba. Brozakatalapa yaka. Shire bozolo poko remanda raba kozele payaraba. Rosa laba kosheke brokotolo payaraba kozeleba. Ye brozo poko shike prakatalapa yeremando robozele pakaya. My honest prayer for whoever is listening to me now is this. That let go of your own understanding, your human wisdom, your human intelligence, and yield to God fully for your hour, for your time, for your generation, for your dispensation, for the calling of God that he has placed on your life. I believe that even as sickness is scattered in the world, a great revival is coming and that answer is through Christ. It's through Christ. My honest prayer is that whoever is listening and watching, may God draw a very definitive part and mark touching your life in this dispensation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're sick in your body right now, regardless of whatever disease you're suffering from, whether COVID or HIV, whatever disease, virus, bacteria, we believe right now in the name of Jesus. As the Bible says, you shall heal the sick, cast out devils, cleanse lepers, raise the dead. He says, for lo, I'm with thee to the end. I pray for healing right now. If you have a relative that is sick of any disease, stretch your faith and word right now for their healing in the name of Jesus Christ. I also speak to your finances. Whoever is watching, may God recuperate. May he resuscitate. I speak to your families. May God reconcile. I speak in the lives of your children. For those of you who are parents, they may be well with your own. May God preserve your household. I speak to the preachers, the ministers, that may God preserve your ministry. May he elevate you in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for our governments, that even as they are applying whatever has to be applied, that the wisdom of God rests on them in this time and period of the hour, that the ounce of God's wisdom will settle in all our leaders to determine well for our nations in this trying time. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and believe. Amen. And if you're there, and you have never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you want to, repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. And tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. 
I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 Four two nine one, or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5pm to 8pm You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero Fenero, make manifest